When we got married, my wife had no toes. I'm starting here because with God as my witness, I have no idea how else to begin this. That's the thing. I don't even know what it is. Account, confession, obituary. I had to write something down. I've taken photos, but nobody would believe she wasn't born. No, stop skipping ahead. Clarity, Benedict, clarity. Start at the beginning. When I married Emily, she had no toes. I married her because of her eccentricities, her stories and her tall tales. I'd always laugh at them, especially the one about how she'd lost the digits on her feet. I'd always seen it as a fanciful way of explaining away a birth defect. It never bothered me, but Emily grew up in an orphanage, and of course, kids can be cruel. I'd always assumed the beach tail was a way to keep old wounds closed. I realize now that was naive. According to Emily, she had been walking the beach at Dovercourt, a bleak and run-down shipping town on the UK's east coast. It was before her parents' accident, so she can't have been older than four. She'd been digging for shark teeth when she found, about a foot below the pebbles and grey sand, a sea slug. This is where the tale took one of Emily's usual flights of fancy. Because, you see, this wasn't just any sea slug. Throughout our marriage, she'd sworn on her parents' graves that the moist creature was the exact size, shape, texture and colour of a human tongue. She even defiantly refused to budge on her assertion that it moved and writhed in her hands exactly like one too. The Emilyism that made me write off the story as fiction for years was what it did after a few minutes of wriggling. According to the wife I'd given anything to hold again, the tongue slug vanished in her hands, disappeared into thin air with no sound or commotion. There one moment, gone the next. You're probably wondering how this relates to her toes though. Well, the tale of the tongue slung ends when four-year-old Emily awoke the next morning to find they were missing. Her parents found the screaming toddler in a bed with severed toes and pools of blood nowhere to be found. The flesh of her feet simply ended, much to her parents' and doctors' confusion, in smooth, blemishless stumps, like the toes were never there at all. Of course, for years I thought the joke was that they never had been, Thinking about the fact that Emily wasn't joking at all still sends a shiver down my spine. It started during the last COVID-19 lockdown. Just like Emily's parents, I was awoken by screaming sobs. Emily was on the floor. She'd fallen out of bed and I could see why straight away. I wish I was man enough to have leaped from the bed, scooped her up and rushed her to the nearest hospital. If I wasn't such a coward, maybe I would have, and none of this would have happened. Instead, all I could do was sit up in bed and scream with her. Her calves were missing. There was no gaping wound or exposed bone from a grisly severing, no pools of blood or shredded tissue. They were simply gone. Emily's knees were now smooth globes at the ends of her thighs. I can feel them. I can feel them. I can feel them. Never heard a person yell like that. Her voice cracked and broke like there was so much panic in her lungs that her throat wasn't strong enough to contain it. I'm embarrassed to admit how long it took for me to calm down, so I won't. Once I had, I clambered down from the bed and sat behind her. I held Emily in my arms for about three, maybe four hours. I only found out I'd spent that long silently sobbing into her auburn hair later though, when I crashed downstairs on the faux leather couch that afternoon. When you love somebody and they're that terrified, time becomes irrelevant. Any mother sat at a bedside in a neonatal ICU will tell you this. I sat and rocked her across those hours, telling her to focus on my breathing despite it being far more from steady or calm. We got there though, somehow. She was sobbing throughout me helping her dress. 
I tried to let her maintain her dignity, do as much for herself as she could, but I found myself overstepping almost every boundary she had. At one point, she actually told me to frick off. Not her actual word, obviously. I'd never heard her swear before. She couldn't explain what she meant when she'd said, I can feel them, until I'd carried her downstairs and sat her on the sofa. We'd watched a documentary on phantom limb syndrome once. It's when amputees get itches they can't stretch on limbs that are no longer there. Emily made it clear, in a plain and matter-of-fact tone, free of any panic or confusion, that as far as her body was concerned, nothing was out of place. When she had woken up that morning, she thought she or I had wet the bed. From the shins down, all she could feel was warm liquid. The strangest part, the part that had shocked her so much she launched herself from the bed, was that she could feel her toes again. After I came round from my exhaustion nap, we had a long talk. I begrudgingly accepted no doctors would be phoned. Emma made the final decision, of course. I begged her to let me take her to the hospital, but she refused point blank. Her argument was bulletproof. Legs don't just disappear, they just don't. The best case scenario was the doctor couldn't do anything. Worst case, well, we'd both watch enough of the X-Files to know people experiencing inexplicable limb vanishing don't spend long outside of military or government captivity. The thought of Emily on a cold steel medical table being dissected by men in Hamzat suits was enough to get me to forget seeking professional help. In the end, Emily did make one concession. I called Shane, a colleague, and the closest thing I had to a friend locally. I couldn't tell him the specifics over the phone for obvious reasons, but my caginess piqued his curiosity and he agreed to come over. He didn't scream, which was a relief. At first, he laughed. Then he smacked his tongue on the roof of his mouth. Then, finally, once the colour had drained from his spray tan face, he sat down. Can I have a glass of water? He eventually managed to ask, eyes not moving from the empty space where he knew his colleague's wife's legs had been a few months ago at the Christmas party. Shane, I'd worked with him for years. I should never have called him. He didn't deserve to die. People react to the unexplainable in different ways. Some panic, others stay calm and take action. Once we'd fully explained our mourning to him, Shane had been the latter. That's why I had to kill him. For once, my absent-mindedness came in handy. If I hadn't left the hammer on the mantelpiece after putting the new shelf up three days ago, it wouldn't have been within easy reach. If it wasn't within easy reach, Shane would have finished dialing 999. If he'd finished doing that, Emily would have been carted away to some test facility and I'd be alone. Frick that. I didn't choose the sharp end of the hammer on purpose, nor did I intentionally drive the thin wedge right into Shane's temple. I was acting too much on instinct to have planned that thoroughly. The surge of adrenaline had streamlined my inner voice into a caveman grunt that simply meant hit, kill. I dropped the dripping tool the moment I realized what I'd just done. I fell to my knees and wept, once again, a five-year-old lost in a supermarket. Emily wasn't sobbing or screaming or yelling or making any sounds of distress. She was laughing. Sweet Mary of Bethlehem, Benedict Boxstead. Who thought you had it in you? Then I was laughing too, still on my knees, face still wet with tears, but laughing all the same. Seems messed up now, I'm writing it down. My newly legless wife and I bent double in near hysterics, while an innocent estate agent leaked all over the floorboards. Panicking wouldn't have helped, and the looming despair was so thick, 
neither of us would find our way back if we ventured into it. Laughter was the only sensible option. Lucky, Shane was a frick boy whose family lived way up in Manchester, Emily mused as I wrapped his body in black bin liners. You only called, right? Didn't message. By the time they come looking for him, there'll be no way to trace it to us. Just make sure you dump your phone. For all her qualities, Emily wasn't smart. For all my faults, many stem from not being the sharpest knife on the rack. That's why I didn't question this now quite obviously ridiculous assertion that no police would come asking around. Even if I had been blessed with a bit more brains though, I was too lost in a barely suppressed panic to notice. That's also the reason I didn't fully register the second time I never heard Emily not use the word frick. Disposing of Shane was a pain in the backside. Emily couldn't help for obvious reasons. A person with no feet isn't much help when dragging the body of a grown man into your back garden. She did sit by the kitchen window after I had the genius idea of repurposing my office chair and a broom handle into a makeshift wheelchair she could punt around on. And I was appreciative of the company as I went about my first dark deed of the next few months. The conversation made digging and filling the hole much quicker. Plus, I'd always felt planting flowers was a group activity. Petunias are better enjoyed with friends. The next week was strange. Emily did one or two Zoom meetings, but eventually signed off sick from her trendy marketing job. The team would cope without a lead. She'd informed her stammering underlings, laptop poised on her shinless thighs. It was on the morning of the next Saturday, exactly seven days from the calf incident, that we took our first step on the descent into madness. I was once more awoken by hysterics from Emily's side of the bed. This time, it wasn't crying though. This time it was laughter. The same kind of maniacal giggling she'd let loose after I removed Shane from the equation with my dad's old hammer. Still half asleep, I rolled over to see what the joke was. The second round of hysterics was from me and they were very much filled with sobs, screams and scrambling away from the woman who shared my bed. My wife had no legs. Her hips ended as the same fleshy, perfect orbs her now vanished knees had been when they'd gone to sleep the night before. To my growing alarm, Emily wasn't at all perturbed by this. Hey, she managed to get out between excited giggles. I did say I wanted to lose weight. She was waving her hand through the air where her thighs had once been. My heart thumped in my chest. What was happening to my wife? And why did she seem so happy about it? Still, the change meant I didn't have to carry her around the house at least. Without the extra weight of her thighs, her arms, now strengthened by a week of office chair punting, were more than capable of functioning as standing legs. She'd walk around the house on her palms, laughing softly to herself when she thought I couldn't hear. When I asked her once what was so funny, she simply rolled her eyes and said, Don't worry, it's nothing you've done. Something's just tickling the back of my knees. Calm the frick down. I couldn't calm the frick down. Firstly because again she didn't say frick. And secondly because how was I supposed to be calm when my wife's legs had disappeared with no explanation? Look, Benny, it's okay. I can still feel them. But it's just phantom limb syndrome. Just like that frickin' show. It took an hour for her to properly explain, mainly because she'd break into more fits of laughter every few minutes. It took another two for me to properly calm down. There was a clear reason too. I knew my Emily and I knew when she wasn't being honest. She didn't believe what she was telling me. To her, this wasn't phantom limb syndrome. In her mind, whatever her legs had gone, they were still with her still attached to her solid flesh and bone. After how the next few weeks played out, I'm not sure I'd argue with her on that if she'd have just come out and said it. Not anymore. 
I spent until the following Wednesday morning trying to make sense of it all. But then the doorbell rang. I don't know why I let him in the house. When the 20-something Jehovah's Witness asked to come in and speak about Jesus, I was too dazed and quietly terror-stricken to fully realize what I agreed to when I said yes. This time, the hammer strike was deliberate. He had been mid-psalm when the metal wedge connected with the back of his skull. The O in the word hope prolonged and slurred as he crumpled in slow motion. Finishing the vowel as a twitching heap on the floorboards, I'd only just scrubbed the blood out of. The wet thud of the hammer collapsing the suburban missionary's head had been loud enough to bring Emily knuckling down the stairs. At least I wasn't weeping this time. She found me stood over the body, quite calm, cleaning the Jehovah's Witnesses' blood off the blunt tool with a wet wipe. I was beyond terrified by my own actions by this point, you see. I'd fully dissociated, I think. I was lost somewhere behind my eyes, screaming impotently as reality to stop and reverse back to before I answered the door. The argument that followed was the worst and definitely weirdest we'd ever had. She didn't talk to me through the window this time. I had to dig a second hole next to Shane's flower bed in silence, left alone while Emily sat by the upstairs window to keep an eye on the confused looking religious door knockers peering through front windows all along the street. I could hear her laughing as I dug, angry cackles which she made no attempt to hide. It was all a frickin' detour, all a distraction, pointless prelude. <laughs> I practically flew through the bedroom door. I'd come in for a glass of water when I'd heard the sound of her shrill ramblings coming down the stairs. The sounds of distress had shaken the kitchen ceiling. No, not distress. Distress was what I started feeling about halfway up the stairs. Emily's shrieking shook the walls of the hallway. She was screaming about, I don't know what, laughing hysterically between every sentence. I'll be with you soon. I'll be with you soon. Tell the man in charge I'm coming. When the door slammed open, she shot upright on her windowsill perch, jumping out of her skin. She looked sheepishly at me, biting her lip to suppress the occasional giggle. Emily? I asked, my voice unsure. Sorry, <laughs> she mumbled. I dozed off. Must have been having a bad dream. Again, I knew her well enough to know that she believed none of those words. I didn't have the time or courage to confront her though. My sweaty palms had more petunias to plant. The next few weeks were a paranoid blur. Well, for me at least. I don't think Emily was aware of very much beyond the changes in her body after the Jehovah incident. I decided it wasn't safe for me to take my attention away from her for too long, so I took some sick leave. COVID-19 was a great cover-up. It would have been hard to explain if we were both expected in an office. I spent my nights at the window, taking long vigils with the lights out, peering through the blinds, and hoping nobody came to claim the guests sleeping under my petunias. The funny thing is, we think the children are safe. <laughs> They're the worst of all of us. She knew the truth though. <laughs> she wrote it down. <laughs> they call them every year. They call them every year. And when it's all said and done, the town's graveyard just gets fuller. The man in charge can't wait to see me. <laughs> he's very angry with you though. No, <laughs> he's not happy with you at all, Benny. It took me a few days to get used to the dark, unnerving things Emily would holler and giggle into the dark bedroom when I had to head out to use the loo or start the next watch at the window. Trying to hold a stable conversation with her was pointless now. Not that I didn't try. Em, are you hungry? Hungry? Huh. Third Tatarax, the eight-armed maggot prince is hungry. The people lost in the pocket dimension if the non-things are hungry. <laughs> You've never been hungry, Benny. You don't know what hungry is. 
Even the most basic questions eventually led to incomprehensible babbling. I learned to look past it. She ate the meals I gave her after all. What did it matter if I couldn't present them without being paid in mind curdling titters that made sleep impossible most nights? My legs, my feet, my tail, <laughs> my legs, my feet, my tail, my legs, <laughs> my feet, my tail. The next change was too much for Emily, I think. What little sanity had remained was gone when I awoke on the morning of the next disappearance. The shoulders, breasts, and head that were once my wife rattled the same words over and over again. Her eyes rolling back in her hair, her expression terrified. She didn't even notice me pick her up and put her in the cupboard. The towels and kitchen roll I wedged in the cracks of the old door did little to quiet the noise. If we were the kind of couple that owned a ball gag, I would have used it. But the rolled up pair of socks would have to do. It didn't seem like she minded as I shut the door, tears streaming down my face. It didn't seem like she was aware of anything but her legs, her feet, her tail. I tried not to dwell on that last one too much while I placed seeds and fertilizer over the Shane and Jehovah mounds. The petunias were wilting and wilting flowers raised suspicion, I told myself. Neighbors can be nosy. It was best to be careful. The sensible reasoning was why I hit Shane's mother with the hammer when she turned around to shut the front door behind her. I of course had the hammer ready when I opened the door. I'm not an idiot. My aim was good as ever. I was also relieved to have something to occupy my time. Upstairs, Emily had managed to dislodge the socks and tenderly planting fresh petunias on the new mound next to Shane's was a good distraction to occupy myself with for the rest of the day. The police showed up two days later. Yesterday, so you have context. I had bigger problems by then though. When I woke yesterday morning, the room was quiet. It took me a few seconds to realize the gentle lull of birdsong wasn't a welcome event. The fact I could hear it meant the hysterical shrieks and cackles from the cupboard had stopped. I know what you're thinking. Surely that was a good thing. Well, it would have been if the soft chuckles and whispers that replaced them went far, far worse. You know, I'm so glad I'm not like you, Benny. I'll get to munch, munch, munch and crunch, crunch, crunch while I watch your skin and melty melts and the shit in your bowels boils until you burst. When the man in charge meets you, he's gonna take your eyes, Benny. He's gonna burn you for a thousand years, but you'll never die. <laughs> That's what he wants with all of you, Benny. All you scumlings, you filthy s'mores and screamy squishes. I'm going to eat them all, Benny. When I get there, I'm going to eat all of them, all the people. I'm gonna eat you too, Benny. You're gonna get there eventually with the rest of the under scum. And when you do, I'm gonna eat you over and over and over. And when your brains ooze out your ear holes because I've crunched, crunched, crunched down on your skull, do you know what I'm gonna do, Benny? I'm gonna to touch myself. It took me five hours of listening to those sanity-breaking promises before I had the nerve to open the door. Emily's head sat on a cushion of auburn hair at the back of the cupboard. Her green eyes rolled back, bulging from their sockets. Her cheeks were red as an open blister, brow coated in a thin layer of sweat that matched my own, and flecks of spittle exploded from her mouth as she whispered, I'm ready, Benny. I'm ready and I'm going soon. I can't wait to meet the man in charge. You'll satisfy me more than you ever have, Benny. She wasn't laughing much anymore. She was panting softly, breaths from wherever her lungs had gone, or wherever they now were, coming through fast and shallow. The disembodied head of my wife whispering pure nightmare fuel wasn't what made me collapse onto the bedroom carpet and vomit though. No, it was the voice she spoke with which did that. The whispers reaching my head through unknown mental avenues outside of my ears weren't Emily's. They weren't even human. The syllables came from a battery of voices, each at least an octave higher than the last. All except one. 
a single bass tone, almost too low to comprehend, that danced in and out of the cascade of degrading noise. The language, the mother tongue of Emily's screeching monologue as it rattled around my skull, I didn't recognize. It was no language of this earth. Yet, to my horror, I understood every word. Soon I'll be free, Benny. <laughs> Soon I'll be free and you'll see me again in three years, nine months, four days, seven hours, 42 minutes, 17 seconds. Then you see how much I munch, 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 and crunch, crunch, crunch. See who has really inside the filthy small you married. The rest happened on autopilot. The subconscious taunting whispers didn't stop when I picked up the jabbering head. They remained uninterrupted as I carried her into the bathroom and placed her gingerly on a towel I'd placed on the toilet seat. She continued her foul declarations for every minute it took for the ceramic tub to fill with warm water. That's how I knew I still loved her. I made sure it wasn't too hot or too cold and even added some bubble bath before I picked up the still whispering head and plunged it under the surface. Human beings can only survive with lungs full of water for a few minutes. Emily's lips didn't stop moving until she'd been under there for at least two hours. I held her temples, tears falling nonstop from my eyes as they remained fixed to her bulging rolling ones. That is, until they too disappeared. Before the final 10 or so minutes, the rest of Emily's head dematerialized. I nearly slipped face first into the bathwater. The auburn eels of hair worming between my white knuckles vanished. I yelled, brushing aside the bubbles. Only one trace of Emily remained. Plump lips, white teeth, and a waggling tongue. Somehow set into a flat piece of skin, much shallower than the depth of the mouth it contained. A mouth that was still moving. I rammed my fist into it in the end. I grabbed that tongue and pulled as hard as I could. Anything to stop the whispers. The water did nothing to dull. A deep crimson bloomed beneath the bubbles. The hard biting at my wrist stopped. I wrenched my arm out of the water, holding a single piece of flesh in my grasp. It was a tongue. A blood-soaked, wriggling tongue. Unlike the rest of Emily, there was a wound where it had left her body. The horror at what I'd done slowly dawned on me. I sat alone on the cold tiles, my wife's limp and severed tongue in my hands, and howled. I stayed there, curled in the fetal position next to a bathtub full of my wife's blood, until the police started hammering at the door about 20 minutes ago. The tongue has gone limp, but hasn't vanished. The mouth has though. Emily's gone, leaving me alone and frightened with the police about to break down the door and find me with the severed tongue of my missing wife and three bodies buried in my back garden. The thing is, after the last three months, prison doesn't seem that scary. That's why I was calm enough to write all this out. I knew I had to tell my side of the story. Let's be real, once that battering ram I can hear finally does its job, that's it for me. You'll be hearing about me on the news. The talking heads will tell you how I'm a serial killer, a hard-boiled psychopath refusing to reveal the location of my wife's body. I'm gonna tell them the truth, but they won't believe it. You and I know better though. You know how like I do that there isn't a body. You'll know as they put me behind bars for life that I'm only guilty of three of the four murders next to my name on Wikipedia. You know like I do that I'm a 25% innocent man. You'll also know the nagging truth that I think is gonna keep me up for the many nights to come. Emily had told me when I'd see her again. In three years, nine months, four days, four hours, 12 minutes and 32 seconds. That's when I saw her, I'd meet the man in charge. That's when, according to Emily, all of her maddening promises would be fulfilled. She could have just been taunting me, teasing me, trying to see just how blatant the untruths she could have filled my head with were before I snapped. I don't think that's the case though. 
Besides, over the years I knew my wife before I drowned her in my bathtub. She told a lot of tall tales. Starting with a particularly tall one about her missing toes. I'm starting to think that maybe her tall tales weren't so tall after all. There are a few moments in life that completely shatter you and your faith. In a boundless ocean of grief, you struggle to hold on to anything that will keep you afloat. A memory, a video, even a smile. It was going to be a Thursday like any other. I came home from work exhausted and grabbed the remote to watch the news. The dogs were excited and ready for their evening walk. I was heating one of my TV dinners when I heard the phone ring. Mr. Aaron Williams, are you the father of James Williams? Yes, why? I asked with a slight break in my voice. Is he okay? Sir, can you please come to St. Peter's, right off Oak and Seventh? Your son is in the ER and you're listed as the emergency contact. My hand started shaking and I was taken over by a sense of impending doom. Is he all right? What happened to him? I asked, working through a lump in my throat. We won't know until the doctors update us, she said. I sped through the red lights, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I was in hysterics, wondering what was going on. I pulled into the parking lot and ran straight into the ER. I was told to wait while he was being treated. A mere 30 minutes later, I saw a doctor coming to talk to me. Mr. Williams, we are sorry. I tuned out everything he said after that. Something about an accidental overdose. Almost everything after that moment seems like a blur. I remember breaking down multiple times and crying on the floor. It felt like someone had taken my heart and shattered it into millions of little pieces. How could this be so abrupt? Why was he taken away from me? I remember asking Greg, one of my closest friends. He didn't have much in the way of answers, but he tried the best he could. Death, unfortunately, follows a series of transactions and errands. Funerals must be planned, estates must be handled, and goodbyes must be said. I didn't have it in me to do any of this. I could barely get out of my bed. Greg stepped up and told me he would take care of it. He had seen what this had done to me and took off from work to ensure that I was still alive. Which is why I didn't hesitate when he told me about the Anastasis funeral home. He told me that they were extremely professional and took care of all details so I could focus on grieving. He offered to drive me there the next day and I took him up on it. The car ride was extremely somber and I was understandably not in the mood for conversation. You know, Aaron, Anastasis offers a special service for grieving parents such as yourself. Assuming he was talking about grief counselling, I asked him to continue. Well, it is a kind of like grief counselling. Don't you think you deserve one last chance to say goodbye to James? Yes, but you and I both know that that's impossible, I replied, with a hint of anger in my words. We go to Anastasis, and Greg told me to follow him as he made his way past the reception and into the back. He knocked on a small office past a row of storage closets. Come in. Greg opened the door and I saw a rustic but well-kept office, adorned with wooden furniture that was at least half a century old. Greg shook hands with a man who looked to be in his early 60s. He was short and his posture wasn't the best, but he was confident when he spoke and had a sympathetic smile. Mr. Williams, I'm extremely sorry for your loss. No parent should have to go through such a situation and I applaud your strength. I understand that you and James weren't on the best of terms. Yes, but what does that have to do with the funeral? Well, we offer a very specific service here at Anastasis. A chance to say goodbye one last time. Greg, what kind of sick fucking joke is this? Have you lost your goddamn mind? I got up, ready to storm out the door. Please, Aaron, give him a chance. Just a few minutes and then I'll take you straight home. I refuse to sit down, but gestured for him to continue. You see, when someone dies, they're not truly gone. There exists a space where their energy, 
soul, if you will, still continues to exist. We have a special burial place where we can channel this energy and establish a fleeting connection between the world of the living and the dead. That's Greg. We did the same for his dad. Greg nodded at me. Bullshit. I'll not fall for this psychic crap. Hey man, what's the harm in trying? If nothing happens, there's no harm done. I sat down and composed myself. I knew what I was offered was wrong, but I was trapped in a deep hole and someone had offered me a hand to climb out. Macabre as it might seem, I was given one last chance to say goodbye. How does this work? I asked him. Leave that to me, the man replied. The funeral was exactly what I hoped it would be. Sympathies were exchanged, people offered their condolences and help, while I just wanted to make it through the day. After the funeral, the man, Wesley I think he was called, came up to me and asked me if I was ready. I nodded. I'll see you at this address a week from now at 7pm, he said, handing me the address to a cemetery. Greg dropped me off home and said that he was happy for me and that I made the right choice. He even offered to take me to the cemetery the following week. The week was no different than from any other. Since my son's death, I was barely going through the motions and didn't have the energy or the courage to even get out of bed. Sometimes I'd wake up and hope that what had happened was just a prolonged nightmare. Pretty soon, a week had passed and Greg came to pick me up. He didn't speak to me the whole way and I have to admit, it was kind of a relief to not be forced to talk. We pulled into the cemetery. We met with Wesley, who led us to the middle of the field. He pointed at the ground and turned to me. Go on, speak with him. I hesitated. James? This was a load of crap. At best, it was a way to scam grieving parents. At worst, I had been convinced to do a ritual by a bunch of psychotic nut jobs. Louder, Mr. Williams. James, are you here, son? I noticed the ground below me getting cold and a brief draft rustling the leaves. I heard light footsteps in my direction. Did dad? I heard behind me. I couldn't believe this was real. My eyes swelled up and tears were rolling down my cheeks. It almost felt like I couldn't breathe. Son, where are you? No response. I'm so sorry for not being there for you. I should have taken better care of you. Please forgive me. It's okay, Dad. I'm now in a better place. A voice sounded exactly like him. Before I could speak another word, Wesley told me that it was time to go and that we shouldn't stay any longer. I protested, but both him and Greg were adamant that the time had come for us to leave. Still in disbelief of what I had witnessed, I asked them both to explain this and to come clean if they were trying to scam me. Listen, Aaron, you got the closure you needed. It's best we don't discuss this any further. Greg will take you home now, Wesley said sternly. I couldn't sleep that night or the night after. I was never one to believe in the paranormal or the afterlife, but hearing James speak to me completely changed the way I thought. I wanted to speak with him again, to ask him how he was doing and to beg for his forgiveness. I kept calling Greg and Wesley, but I always got told that the time wasn't right, that I shouldn't be abusing the privilege. I kept quiet, but deep down, I knew that I had to speak with my son again. On James's birthday, July 2nd, I couldn't control myself any longer. I found the piece of paper that Wesley had given me and drove to the cemetery at night. I stood in the middle of the ground, now marked by a couple of leaves and kept trying to reach out to James. James, look, I'm back. Please tell me if you're here. I yelled, kicked and screamed, but to no avail. I was just about to turn around and go back home when I heard something. It was a cacophony of noise, barely discernible. It was extremely loud and it seemed to be headed my way. Leave, it said. I heard footsteps, but it sounded like someone was running toward me. I was overtaken by a feeling of fear, like I had violated something sacred. As the footsteps got closer and closer, I started running. The sound got louder and louder. Screeching through the noise, I heard a familiar voice. Dad, why did you do this? Why did you bury me here? I would have turned around 
but it felt like footsteps were right behind me. I got in my car and drove as fast as I could until I was home. I called Greg and Wesley immediately. Both of their numbers had been disconnected. I tried going to the cemetery again, but could no longer find the address. All I wanted was a chance to say goodbye to my son, but I'm afraid that I may have corrupted his soul instead.